Hello, everybody. Thank you for coming. Um, so I've got a short letter from Eva Pell, the um, Undersecretary for Science at the Smithsonian, which I'll just read out. And I'll make a couple of remarks of my own <laughs> and then get out of the way, which is the most important thing I'm going to be doing here today. Can you hear me now? Yes. Whoa. <laughs> well, it's a good thing I didn't say anything very important. Um, so this, this is uh, from, from Eva Pell. Dear Alberto and the ADS team, congratulations on the outstanding success of the ADS project. Among the sciences, astronomy is distinctive in having created a sophisticated information infrastructure that provides access to scientific publications and data that is freely and publicly accessible. With more than 10 million records in the ADS digital library, you have dramatically changed how researchers all over the world um, access data, as well as interested members of the public. Through a powerful and easy to use interface that uses, allows one to search by author, object, or words in the title or abstract, you have made it possible for users to find articles relevant to their research. Beginning with 200 users in 1994, today there are more than 10 million users. Is that true? Really? <laughs> 10 million? Wow. It's amazing how you learn these things. ADS exemplifies the outstanding research that SAO performs and the tremendous service that SAO provides to the worldwide community of scholars. And I'd just like to support that personally on behalf of the astronomers, most of whom are not at the Center for Astrophysics. Um, I was. Um, at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, um, looking to move to the University of Pennsylvania when ADS took over my life. And it transformed my relationship to the refereed literature, permanently and for the good. And I can attest that that's a representative experience uh, for, for people of my generation who started out with personal subscriptions to journals that we lugged around, that we let go. And it was a good thing. So thank you on behalf of the astronomers of the world. And I'll now hand over to Mike Kurtz. Thank you, Charles. So I, I get to introduce Christine Borgman, uh, our speaker. But first, uh, I'd like to thank the people who came. We invited some people to be here, and some actually are here. There are people who uh, supported us in the beginning, uh, and without you, ADS would not have happened. And for those who are here and those who didn't come, we thank you very much. It was not from the beginning, completely obvious to everyone that the ADS Abstract Service was a good idea, and without you it would not have happened. I'm going to uh, talk about four people first before I give it over to the speaker. Uh, the first one is Gunter Eichhorn, who isn't here, but was our project manager for the first 15 years of the project uh, before he left for greener pastures, or perhaps I should say browner, since he now lives in Tempe, Arizona, where it's much warmer. Uh, the second is Gunter Riegler, and uh, through him, uh, NASA. Uh, NASA started and supports the information infrastructure in astronomy, uh, the, the large data archives that are at the center of modern astronomical research are primarily uh, driven by NASA. Uh, the MAST at Space Telescope, the Chandra Archive, the Einstein Archive, the URSA, the IPAC, the NED, the CDS SIMBAD, and the ADS are all part of the NASA, uh, well, what do you call it, portfolio of research that they support. This didn't just happen. Somebody had to have a vision, and a great deal of that vision was actually going to Riegler. Well, next I'm uh, going to talk about, let's see, if I hit this button, do I get my slide? I'm going to talk about Joyce. Joyce Ray Watson was our librarian here. She founded the CFA library. We used to have two libraries, the Harvard College Observatory Library and the uh, Smithsonian Astrophysical Library, or uh, Observatory Library. They were physically separate for quite a long time. And uh, she actually merged them. It's not just an amalgam. It's a real merger, and she did that. She was also the PI uh, on the SIMBAD for the United States Project, and she wrote the original uh, user manual in English. It was written in French originally. Uh, well, in 1983, Joyce showed me where the Astronomicus Russian Institute had put, made magnetic tapes of its abstract book, Astronomy and Astrophysics Abstracts, 
and said that they were going to make them public. So from that time on, Joyce and I strategized as to what we would do if we ever got our hands on these things. It, uh, it wasn't sophisticated. We were thinking about files and grep, actually. Uh, <laughs> but uh, that, that was the beginning of uh, thinking about it, and that was Joyce. Joyce is the one who knew that first. Uh, in 1990, Joyce finally got a copy of one year worth of ANA abstracts on tape. And she got it by going to Heidelberg where she had a connection. Uh, she went to the Reshnin Institute and in a brown paper bag wrapped up in aluminum foil, uh, anonymously sitting on a table in the foyer, uh, were these two magnetic tapes. I've never known how they got there. <laughs> uh, the, uh, the prototype for the ADS was made with those tapes. Uh, Joyce uh, died in 2001, but before she died, we were able to publish this uh, issue of Astronomy and Astrophysics uh, Supplements, uh, which has articles about ADS and CDS in it. Uh, all the authors signed uh, the, the book, and we sent it to Joyce. So she got it about six months before she died. Next, uh, Peter Osorio. Peter Osorio uh, is a leader in figuring out how human beings behave and putting that into a descriptive format. He is viewed as the father of descriptive psychology, which is a small sect among psychologists. But one of the things he did in the 1960s is he's the first person, I believe, to figure out how to use eigenvectors to model topics on the basis of the distribution of words in documents and build a search space. In 1988, he introduced me to the modern concept of searching the literature. Uh, he and Jeff Shaw ran a company called Ellery Systems. Ellery was uh, a computer system manufacturer of some sort, software, and they built an internet system which had a browser and a web type interface several years before the web. So when the web finally came along, it was no problem at all for Gunter to make the switch over, which he did in 1994. Peter died in 2007. Did it come up? No. Let's see. How do I make this big? Here? Okay. All right. Uh, now I get to introduce Christine. Uh, Christine is a leading researcher in information science. She is the... Uh, she has the Presidential Chair in Information Science at the University of California at Los Angeles. She is the winner of the Research Prize of the American Society of Information Science and Technology. Her latest book, uh, which is, uh, let's see, I knew I would forget the name of the book. Uh, let's see, how, tell oh, me the name of the book. Scholarship in the Digital Age. Scholarship in the Digital Age. I keep thinking of it as digital scholarship, and I know it's wrong, so I can't <laughs> say it. Uh, anyway, it won the... Uh, prize for best information science book of the year, the year it came out. Uh, that's the second time Christine has won this prize. Uh, she's uh, been the thesis advisor to a number of people, including Alberto Pepe, who's currently a postdoc here. Uh, right now, she's at Oxford as the Smithies visiting lecturer. Is that what it is? Something. And fellow, uh, she's working on another book uh, about data. Uh, not just about the usual suspects like astronomy, but about things like uh, the study of uh, the di uh, of the trans uh, of the illuminated manuscripts of Buddhist monks in China in the fifth century has been transformed by digitization, and she's weaving that all together. And what I'm sure will be extraordinarily introduct interesting book. Anyway, enough. Uh, here's Christine, our uh, speaker at our 20th birthday party. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Is, is my mic on now? Excellent. Great. Thank you. It is a great pleasure to be here and uh, an honor to say the least. I have uh, been studying astronomy for five or six years now 
at uh, the generous invitation of Alex Zale, who brought us into the community after we'd been studying other sciences for 10 or 15 years. And of course, I jumped at the chance to work with Alex and the data net and, uh, and bring that along. And then Alyssa Goodman invited us into this community, and George Jogowski invited us into the astroinformatics community. And those three became uh, the overview and, and the, the oversight board. So that's quite the cast of characters to advise us, and hopefully we're fairly honest about um, astronomy. And it's also, as a social scientist, you want to give back to the community that's been so generous in, in all of your time of letting us come and follow you around and, and interview and so on. But it's, it's often hard to just kind of get a toe in the door to, to come back and talk. So when Michael and Alberto said, would you come and keynote this and talk to all these astronomers, I said, what an incredible honor and opportunity, and also to the, the webcast out there um, in California and, and around the world. So thank you for that, and I hope I can do ADS some, some justice. Certainly, I cannot give the history. They and other Charles and people in this room can give the history far better than I ever could. But what they asked me to do was to set the, the marvel of ADS in context of scholarly communication and infrastructure and what's so special about what's been done here and how it compares to what's been done in other fields. So that's, that's my goal. And uh, my talk is divided into three sections. I'll spend the first third or so talking about digital scholarship, which is another way of saying scholarship in digital age, Michael. Uh, <laughs> and then the middle third, um, I'll try to contextualize ADS and astronomy scholarship and then come um, and say challenges ahead. I mean, what's been accomplished here in 20 years is phenomenal, but we're not going to let them rest on their laurels. We're going to um, show that there's probably a few more things left for this uh, community to work on. So let's start with this, this funny phrase. Scholarship is certainly something that's intellectual. It's something you do. It's not something that is digital per se. So, so why do we have this funny oxymoron that's gotten very popular? It's, it's this. It is a way of saying that scholarship is changing, that it's the set of infrastructure, the tools, and the services. And so many of those are digital. So we, we think about relationships, we think about moving things around in the cloud, we don't think about that app J under our shoulder anymore, we think about this little device in our hands and, and our laptops. How many different um, apps are there just to use ADS, say, on, on your smartphone? Probably quite a few by now. Archive, certainly, as well. I mean, the, the very fact that you've got 10 million users of something and virtually 100% penetration. Can you think of any other technology in any field or application that gets that kind of adoption? You know, cer certainly not one that, that I know of. Okay. Scholarship has been about books and paper and documentation for some hundreds, some thousands of years, depending on, on what, you, um, what you want to count. The you know, Gutenberg is back to the 1400s. Uh, I have, as Michael said, been interviewing a Buddhist philologist who's one of the world's experts in the third to fifth century um, manuscripts and, and early Chinese writing of the Buddhist scripts. So the history of documentation is probably as, as old as astronomy. And certainly astronomy has been a very well-documented field from the beginning. So it's, it's not that surprising that innovation would happen here. And it's also not that surprising that it's happening in Buddhism because sharing the sacred word is considered a meritorious act. And so the fact they have taken it from scrolls all the way to full XML markup in uh, doing current Chinese um, philology is you know, just sort of part of the way that they do their business. But this is where we are now, is data which, of course, have always been part of scholarship and part of your evidence, particularly in the, the physical sciences, is no longer something that's, say, an interim part of the process. And this is, this is actually a very profound change. Since the dawn of scholarly journals, you were expected to summarize your findings and produce those and you know, somebody might come along and ask you for your data and evidence on which it's based, but actually producing it, much less 
publicly depositing it for somebody else to use is, is quite the sea change in thinking about scholarship. And that's an area also where astronomy is, is on the leading edge and bleeding edge, and ADS has played a very important role in that transition. So you've got massive amounts of data, and as we go from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey to PanSTARS to LSST and so on, you're going up by orders of magnitude, you know, really qualitative differences in scale of how you do the science. It's not just quantitative, it's changing qualitatively. So if we're going to take advantage of that, we would want to be able to reuse those data. We want archives like Chandra and Hubble and so on around the country and around the world. Uh, but to do so, to make them reusable, is not a technical act. It's not just a matter of depositing them somewhere. There's a great deal of technical expertise and domain expertise and archival expertise that's involved in doing so. What you really want is to be able to interpret these data. And that's part of what this community is doing and doing, uh, again, far better than most. This is a diagram from uh, Pe Alberto Pepe is the first author on it. Uh, this comes from work that we did for 10 years on embedded sensor networks. So I was a, one of the uh, founding uh, co-PIs of the Center for Embedded Network Sensing at UCLA and four other universities in, uh, in California. And while this particular diagram is specific to sensor networks, you can draw a similar one for astronomy, for you know, parts of biomedicine, for classics, and, and even for Buddhist philology. It's useful to think about the way that you do your scholarship in terms of all the different steps that you take. And what we were trying to do here was to say this is a continuous cycle. You might start here with designing the particular study, choosing the devices, in this case choosing the field site to go out and study harmful algal blooms. You had computer scientists, engineers, biologists all working together. Uh, but at each stage in this process, you're throwing off some kind of an artifact, some kind of piece of scholarship. It might be field notes, it might be metadata, it might be a reprint, it might be a preprint, it might be a journal article, it might be a textbook. The data goes through multiple stages. You've got some theoretical models. You need to make sense of it. There's a lot of software in here. There's all these different parts to it. Okay. So we, we could draw this picture for astronomy, but this is a pretty one that um, we've used before. So part of what's happening in this change is we are disaggregating things. So all the publications are in ADS. The celestial objects are cataloged in CDS and in NED. Um, we've got uh, the preprints in archive. We have the, the full articles in ADS. We've got the data spread all over the place. They're being atomized. And so bringing them back together, re-aggregating them, is part of the challenge. If you think back to Isaac Newton and standing on the shoulders of giants, that was a notion really of a fairly linear chain of, of bibliographic evidence. So the, you know, that phrase is meant to refer to the fact that you know, he had this paper and he could refer to the evidence that came before and that built on the evidence prior to that. We could probably still follow his chain because it was all together in that one document. But now that document's divided up into all these pieces, all these versions that get published independently. This is a well-known diagram from linked open data. You don't need to think, read all those little dots in there. The point is more that we want to bring them together. And I've had examples from many different fields of the difficulty of, of bringing those pieces back together again. Part of what we need to do, then, is reinvent the scholarly record. So the scholarly record is no longer just those journal articles because we're concerned with all these other pieces that we might want to do something with them. Librarians will think in terms of selecting, collecting, organizing, discovering, retrieving. The interpreting part tends to be much more human. You need to use things, uh, make sense of them. You may not need to use them alone. You might want to combine them. 
So the, the fresh new results, the fresh new observations, you might publish alone, but you might also publish them in combination or contrast to things from prior studies, different instruments, different places, and you need to be able to reconcile them and know what you've got to pull them back together again. Reproducibility and replication will vary from field to field. There was a, a science issue last year that talked about uh, reproducibility as the gold standard of science. It turns out to be very, very difficult to do. In only a few fields can you actually reproduce the results. Uh, and when it comes down to questions of fraud, withdrawing papers, that's when you get down to those degrees of argument about them. Things like replication or verification are more straightforward, but this also gets into the peer review process. Are you expecting the peer reviewers to, say, peer review the data set as well as peer reviewing the journal article? And that, that's part of the shift when you start to say, the data are public, well, who's going to add some kind of uh, certification, some imprimatur on the data. Well, you know, the well-curated data archives, that's one of the roles that they play. So things like the trust fabric and who's going to curate these things, who, who's going to play these roles are, are part of what's, uh, what's evolving. Okay. This is an, uh, another beautiful one. You, the astronomers make such gorgeous slides, there was no point in trying to recreate them. I just <laughs> borrowed them and, and, re, and re in the spirit of open science, have repurposed them um, <laughs> to make some different points out, out of a few. Uh, I noted you know, that 1665 being the first uh, journal article is about 230 years after Gutenberg, and of course 1,000 years or more after the, the first Chinese printing. Uh, so then we have that, this another 230 year jump before your astrophysical journal came out. And you know, part of Alyssa's argument here is that this took a long time even to get from this kind of journal to this, and then this, this jump to the 3D PDF. But I've used similar examples to show that you know, the PDF doesn't look that different, that this early journal, this early annals journal from Britain is still being published continuously, and it looks a whole lot the same <laughs> from 1665 as it does now. And we tend to just kind of lock them up and, and freeze them as though it were a page image. And one of my frustrations at Oxford is I can only print things on A4 paper, completely screws up all this stuff. Um, I mean, it just, you just jam the printers if you try to put something on a, a US uh, letterhead. You just sort of forget that. Um, and now we're moving into Authoria, which Alberto and Alyssa and others are taking the lead on. And so this, again, is rethinking. It's uh, not just writing in the cloud, it's pulling that, it's re-aggregating the cycle so that you can write together in the cloud and you can publish together in the cloud. But there's a, a number of you in this room are involved with other ways of, of tying these pieces together. This is an, another nice one. You know, um, now, Michael calls this his Christmas tree, but you've, you've got to think 3D here, of sort of pulling the paper up the top and have everything else cascade down. I think we, um, we'll get some artists to do that. Uh, but this is interesting, and again, I'm good, probably going to make a different point than you did with this slide, is that ADS is a paper-centric view of the world. So in that sense, you are reinforcing that 1665 model of what scholarship is, to say everything should point back to the paper. The paper is what documents the data. The paper is the point that you use to discover, to interpret, to reuse the other things that are associated with it. We can also put a fairly long history on things like networks of references and citations. I mean, what, what Michael has done with the bibliometrics, I mean, the very rich bibliometrics you can do because you've got such a comprehensive set. Some people have dated bibliometrics all the way to, back to biblical uh, scholarship in terms of annotations, relationships between chapters. So that part of it, again, isn't new, not conceptually, but what's new is really thinking of this as a network and then starting to open up that network and, and tie pieces from one to the next. So notice, I mean, we could take sort of a fairly infinite regress out from here of all the different kinds of, of pieces for where we would be going with it. 
Okay, so we're, we've, we're pretty sure about how to cite publications. We've got several hundred years of history in that. Now, how do we cite data? Well, that is, you know, Mercy and I were talking about earlier, that's an, a very long conversation. And it wouldn't seem like it was that hard. And when we started talking about it with CoData and the Board on Research Data and Information and others at, uh, the, at the academies, it was, oh, well, we'll just, you know, should it be APA or Blue Book or sort of what, what format should it be for bibliographic reference? And I kept arguing that it's not just about a bibliographic reference, it's about what is it, you, what is it you're going to cite? What's the unit? And then realizing that people in astronomy don't even agree completely on the definition of an observation, much less the definition of a data set. At least a paper, you know what the unit is that you're citing. So the fundamental difficulty with data citation is not whether it's a link or a data site or a DOI or a handle or whatever it is. It's these much more sort of epistemological deep kinds of problems that are being uh, played out. So I um, complained enough about the narrow conceptualization that they put me in charge of the workshop, um, which is what you get for your sins, and Michael came and talked about ADS and the bibliometrics as part of this. Uh, but this is what, a 200 page proceedings? Just, you know, at a first cut to, begin to think through the problem. And uh, there's another best practices report, which is coming out in the third or the fourth year of the International CoData ICSTI study on the task group on data citation and attribution. So any month now, we will have another 200 page report. <laughs> coming out on data citation and attribution. And these are the kinds of things that make it so complicated, is in some areas you've got legal responsibility. You use somebody else's data, they will define exactly how it has to be referenced. But mostly we're talking about a set of scholarly relationships about who has to get credit for what. And as uh, universities get more concerned about metrics and counting and tying pieces back together again, uh, they want to count things in different ways. One of the things that was interesting about this particular workshop is our starting premise was that the scholars would be more likely to deposit their data if they got credit through citation. But what we found is everybody throughout that entire life cycle had their hand out for credit. The repositories wanted credit, the funding agencies wanted credit, the vice presidents for research wanted credit, the librarians wanted credit. And as soon as you realize it's a credit system with a lot of different stakeholders, each of whom has different standards of evidence for what they're looking for, you begin to see why it's so hard to come up with some consistent way. Um, so Merce, to her credit, got us around a table over lunch in March in Amsterdam, and one page, eight points. This is what data citation should be. Okay. Um, now, we did have the advantage of already having seen the draft of the 200-page report that's coming out, so this pretty much echoes the, the main points of, of what you will see when that report finally comes out. Um, and Tim was at this, this meeting as well. Um, and uh, you can go to the website for the details. But notice, I mean, on the one hand, these are intended to be pretty high order principles and not, um, not implementation, uh, but they are ones that say, you think about it as a citable prod project uh, and persistent repositories. And if you're going to cite it, that presumes that this is something that's going to stick around. So there's a whole lot of assumptions about the way scholarship get, gets done that are embedded on, underneath this. So it's, um, I think it is quite masterful that we got it down to eight points in, in one page. So it's, uh, thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, oh, we won the prize, too, from the conference, yes. So there was, there was a prize for the best proposal of really moving scholarship forward, and this project won the prize. So this is, this is the, the underlying problem. If, if, if astronomers can't agree on what an observation is, believe me, in every other field, it's even worse. It's, it's, astronomers have more sense of agreement about what your data are. Uh, the years and millions that were spent on just coming up with ontology of the rat brain is incredible. 
uh, lots of work on, on workflows and biomedics. Um, you know, so all of these different things. I mean, you want, might look at Marie Curie's notebook for the content of her work. You might look at the history. You might look at the paleography of her handwriting. I mean, those could be data in, in many, many different ways for many purposes. And so when the funding agencies come through and say, thou shalt preserve thy data, it becomes very messy to come up with uh, approaches that work across all of them. So one of the other projects that we have with uh, computer scientists, Ian Foster and Carl Kesselman, are part of this, is uh, to look at these folks that are way out here. There's, there's kind of a line that got miss went missing here is you've got a small number of people, it's estimated to be about 10,000 working astronomers who have access to large volumes of data. Our people in the sensor networks are way out here. You've got small teams. They are out collecting something about the wind tunnels in a particular area of the mountains in Southern California, and they're just not comparable to anything else. I mean, we look at their instruments, and it's this is the one with serial number they bought off the shelf. This is the one that Eric put some tinfoil on. This is the one the graduate student's dissertation is. I mean, there's nothing approaching the consistency of um, data calibration or instrumentation. So it's a very different kind of problem when you get out here. So not to say astronomy is easy, because it's not, but the actually dealing with the data and the coordination is more straightforward in astronomy than in the fields that we study. So that's my big picture. That, that's your tour of scholarship in the digital age in 15 minutes. Okay. Um, so now we'll go on to a beautiful astronomy picture of the day um, and another of Alyssa's slides. What I uh, like about this one uh, is that it puts a person in the middle. It puts the astronomer in the middle. For, and of course, Vermeer's gorgeous piece that's in the, the Louvre. And the balancing, the fact that your astronomer has sort of equal weight behind the literature, this is your shoulders of giants, and the tools of the trade, the instruments, the, um, the repositories, the cataloging of the objects and so on, that you've got many different people involved and expertise, but it's the, per it's the person in the middle thinking about getting new observations, but looking at the science that, that came before. Okay, so that, that's really, I think that, that's the way to think about the infrastructure for your field. And this is the, uh, this is the title of the, the book in progress uh, with these amazing, we shall see, case studies. This is rather ambitious, I must say, to try to get that range, but I, I'm working on it. Uh, but this is the model that I have is I'm trying to compare fields around the sort of size dimensions, around the origins of the data, and around the different ways that they're processed and handled. And so take a, a view and acknowledging it's an information perspective, it's not the way that astronomers would describe the fields themselves. But the sources and resources in my model look like this, that there is the, you know, the agreement that, that celestial objects alone in combination are generally what people are interested in. You've agreed on some organizing principles. Alyssa is always telling me there's only one sky. And, there's, and when, when it comes to rats, there's not only one rat. You know, it's, 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 they, they don't agree anywhere near as much on the fact that there is one sky, and you've agreed on this world coordinate system, and you know, even if the divisions, the electromagnetic spectrum might be arbitrary, at least you've agreed that that's a very important organizing principle. Uh, the ob observing astronomers we talk to, they observe with telescopes which have separate instruments. The theoreticians we talk to either tell us we don't do data, or they tell us that the data are the output of their models and that they are ex experimentalists. Okay, so there's so there's those general classes of, of what people seem to to think our data. So again, the beauty of, of the design of ADS with this paper-centric model, which gets back to the way scholarship is done, um, is this coordination. It's, it's the re-aggregation before we were using those kinds of terms. And the fact that you know, the 20 years ago was just as the World Wide Web was being built, was you know, 93, 94 in that, that stage. 
allowed you to begin from the beginning at the early stages of that technology. If ADS had started a couple of years earlier, and on a prior platform, you would have had to undo the infrastructure. You might not have been able to move anywhere near as quickly and move toward as open a model as, as you were able to. So the, um, I'm sure plenty of people should deserve credit for that insight of, of taking a chance on, on something very new. But it's allowed ADS to be able to coordinate with the cataloging of you know, the object-centered world it was CDS with Strasbourg and the uh, librarians and archivists in, in France and um, NED in um, California and get all the material from the journals, work with the libraries and then this, this rich cataloging and Michael put librarians up there, I didn't but I would have if you hadn't, <laughs> librarians, uh, librarians and archivists. These, you know, the, the unsung heroes, the, the behind the scenes, the people who add value. And you know, having spent some time with Sherry Winkleman and Arnold Rotz earlier today, you know, the kind of labor, the kind of skilled expertise that goes through and makes very fine-grained informed decisions about what is a Chandra paper. You know, we've been hand waving for years about, oh, we've got if we could just get the publications and the data tied together, wouldn't it be great? But we're back to the what our data problem, and then it's what's what what does it mean for a paper to use Chandra data? Turns out to be a really complicated set of criteria. And if each re, if each archive has a slightly different set of criteria, that makes it even more complicated and gets you back to that question of interpretation. When you've got a link, what does that link mean? So we've got this trusted value add here, and then it gets scooped back into ADS. So ADS is adding value from this disparate way back to, back to the middle again. And the incentive is not just to keep it in Chandra, keep it in Hubble, keep it in the other places, because you improve the discoverability and you improve the science by bringing it back here to the middle again. Okay. So this is uh, just a clip off the, the lovely website. And I, I mean, it, this is a remarkable list of accomplishments. I mean, to get the kind of adoption, the kind of take up, to have the foresight to move to a completely unproven platform in the beginning to think about the relationship between objects and publications at the very beginning because that, that partnership was, was at the base of all this. I mean, right now it all makes, oh, complete sense, but it probably was a lot of blood on the floor in those early years to, to have made some of those decisions. And what looks obvious now was, was, not, so, um, was not so obvious at the time and then added various features. And I think also noticing, if, if you look through these and if, if you look at more of the, the detailed histories that Michael and Alberto and, and other partners have written, you will see a movement also from a more monolithic model. I mean, those of us who sort of cut our teeth in computing in the 80s and, and even before would think in terms of, you know, you just gotta build the right system, get all the parts in there and that architecture is no longer feasible and they've gone more and more open as, as the architecture has changed as well. Okay. And they play nicely with others, with lots of others. Okay. And notice that these are not just others from the astronomy community, these are others from the library and the publishers community and the other repositories and they're not just in the US, this is you know, again around the world. Of this is interoperability and, and collaboration writ large. And you know, I've always mentioned the, the Chandra and the sets of relationship, but again, getting tying the objects, the observations, the papers together is that, that re aggregation. And I, in all the fields we've studied, I've not seen anything as comprehensive as what ADS, in combination with partners, has been able to do. And it also has allowed you to do these various other value-added tools on top of it for administration. I mean, you can see the, you can see the productivity of, 
a particular lab. You can see, you can follow the ideas uh, through scholarship. Administrators love being able to say how many papers came from our data and how much were they cited and, and, and single wonderful metrics that you can put in web pages. But what's, what's more important is the fact that you can use these things, to, you, you can look for new ideas, you can look for untargeted areas, you can look for what's been overly mined, you can look for uh, interesting correlations that are, that are worth following up in different ways. So all of that's been done as well. So fabulous work, but we've got a little more to keep you guys, you know, keep guys busy for a while. And uh, these are the ones that, that I will go through and, and sort of overlap from one to the next, is that the long tail problem, some of the, the adding value and the integration, the use and reuse, um, and life cycle thinking. Okay. So this is, uh, you know, back to our, our long tail slide again, is we found very early on in interviewing astronomers that yes, most, most of you are in that head of the tail, the small number of people with access to massive, you know, terabytes, petabytes, massive amounts of data. Alex tells us about the fastest way to move the Sloan Digital Sky Survey from coast to coast is to put it in terabyte disks and FedEx it. Okay. <laughs> I think we, you know, we may be getting beyond that point, but you know, we're not quite there yet. You've got more data than the, the technical infrastructure is, is ready to support, and you're scaling up even faster than, than the infrastructure is. But we're, so we're finding that you know, the major missions are building in the archives, building in the expertise from the beginning. Even there, though, they're not doing it consistently. You know, there's different instruments, there's different science questions. There's no common place where you can go and say, find me every observation uh, within this parameter space. You can start with CDS or NED and, and look for an object and search that way, but it's still fairly localized. What's more interesting is that big parts of astronomy are actually way out in the, in the, uh, the tail. We are finding observations sitting on desktops and sitting on local servers and um, probably floating around on flash drives and various other places. And then, the, we, then we came across a project from uh, Dot Astronomy that wanted to deal with the abandoned orphaned and the zombie data um, and let you deposit your data someplace that you kind of got halfway through analyzing and you ran out of time and went on to something else and let you anonymously deposit it, like let go of it and not put your name on it if you wanted to. So this is sort of the opposite of the data citation. This is the, I don't want to be, it might be interesting, but you don't want to look at how I mucked it up along the way. Okay. Um, so. It's, it's not, I mean, and this is something, when we talk to people outside astronomy and say astronomy might, might look like a pure big data science, it's not. There's actually a lot of interesting little stuff scattered around, I'm seeing some heads shaking, <laughs> yes, there's a lot of sort of um, data gone missing in, in various places. Um, then this is sort of that, that top down set of issues, this, I should put the, date in here really big. So this was 2001. This is 12 years ago that you drew this in little black and white PowerPoint. And, and your, edges don't, your edges don't quite match up, Michael. So. <laughs> um, from there. So, uh, so some tools have gotten better over time. <laughs> but you, got your, you, know, you still got your people here at the top. Um, and you got the ADS and the CDS. These pieces are working together. But this was a proposal, TDS being the, the telescope data system, just to keep it, the symmetry going between the ADS and, and the CDS. And you know, this is the, can we go to one place and find all the observations? And you, know, you said how you, you know, came up against a whole lot of friction that people didn't want to aggregate because you were going to lose too much of the local detail which is also I've gone from sort of the top down to the bottom up. But this is a nice, you know, sort of simple one of a proposal of thinking about the, the world. This is 10 years later, did it again. Okay, so, you know, this is, is sort of presents the same idea in a different way of could, you know, can the VAO index be a way to, to and that also was never really built, that, you know, the, there's a lot of good things clearly that have come out of the virtual observatory, but it's not solved all of the, the problems. You've got a lot of standards, you've got, 
you've learned a lot of issues and, and problems, but you know, a single answer is not likely in any field, even one as, as coherent and collaborative as astronomy is. This bottom part, this is the part that's really working, and again, based on the insight, the foresight 20 years ago, that the publications, the objects, should be fundamentally related. And this part you know, apparently sort of works over the observations to, to object side. You've got more curation here. This is the part over here on the side. This is the part where it's the librarians and the archivists. People around here, people in France, people around the world are sitting down and reading your articles word by word, trying to figure out what's the data, what's the object, what are the pieces, enriching it with metadata, looking for things that are you know, multi-wavelength, multi-observatory, things that combine old data and new data, and enriching it. This is, I mean, to think about how high-powered and technical astronomy is and then realize the amount of hand crafting that's going on over here, I think is something also to bear in mind. Your infrastructure has a lot of people in it, and it probably always will have. You, know, you would automate what you want to automate, but you also want to leave room for, for judgment calls because there's a whole lot of judgment that the science, the science is in the judgment. Okay. Um, again, a very nice one from Alberto, and Alyssa is the lead on this, of ADS being the anchor, and because you've got all the publications and the metadata sitting right here, you can now begin to tie more pieces in, and the really new part here is this astrotag literature to be able to take the images, toss them into astrometry.net, and automatically catalog anything that is sort of has a clear coordinate system. And again, because you agreed on a coordinate system, you can take a picture of the night sky with a telephone camera, throw it in, and you can actually register it in space. And for the reason Alyssa and Alberto were coming over to visit us in Oxford in February was to work with Zooniverse. And the people who brought you Galaxy Zoo and brought you old, uh, old weather and ways to make games out of doing science, they're now working with to find a way to make games out of things that you can't automate to get the people in. And again, get the people excited, get students excited, and bring all these pieces back, um, back together again. But you couldn't do it if you didn't have a solid base of infrastructure <coughs> on which to build. Okay, Back to our usability problem. Um, you know, looking at ADS and the tools around, you can often see, you know, here's a data set. I can open it with any of these two or three tools that people pretty much have in astronomy departments. That's not true in most fields. I mean, when, when you see a file, it might be just some raw bit stream. Unless you know what's in it and what tool will open it to make sense of it, you don't know if you've got a FITS file or an SPSS file. And, you know, the kinds of things that you've got to deal with over there at IQSS. Um, you want to be interpret, evaluate it, open it. You need to be able to find enough about it to, to make sense before you even open it. And um, those are some of the things that we were wrestling with around the usability and how much of that you could, you could load on to the data citation problem. Okay. The risk of stereotypes. I am one. My mother was one as well. Um, is... It's not just a matter of, of relabeling, you know, what the librarians and, and the archivists do in this, in this network. It's also recognizing that the skills in cataloging and organization and metadata, those actually go back hundreds of years as well. I mean, they're, they're as old as astronomy, and the principles that we're using to add that metadata are very old principles and skills. But we don't look like that so much anymore. Um, we let our hair down or put red glasses on or you know, whatever it takes um, to do it. We have some new ones who look like this. It's probably not quite, the, uh, not quite the attitude you want. But you know, we got, I've, I've got some real punk students at UCLA. Let me tell you, Los Angeles gets them. Yeah, you, you met a few of my very heavily, heavily metaled um, students, heavily metaled and heavily tattooed uh, MLIS students. Uh, so, you know, we need all of this, but we also need more of these. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> gotcha, gotcha, Chris. Um, is, you know, we need more librarians who are going to help you with your NSF data management plan and who are going to write Python scripts for you and who think it's very cool to have old pieces of rockets in their office <laughs> as well. Okay, so it's, you know, it's, it's a new generation. It's, it's a new kind of skills that's going to come out. Um, this is, you know, one of the last points that, that I want to make is to point you to the big data problem. And, and Mercy was at the you know, White House meeting about big data. The Obama loves it, Wall Street loves it, Main Street loves it, the European Union, lo everybody loves big data. The, the big, there's a big data book that's number five on the science bestseller list of the New York Times right now. And the difficulty with the big data movement is it's all about correlation. We don't need to worry about causation. Causation's a bad word. If you got enough data, if you crunch enough stuff, we can make decisions. I mean, the stock market crashed because automatic trading based on Twitter feeds. Okay. You know, how much of that control do you want to let go? Now, the elevator speech from anybody who works with big data is something along the lines of, we've got this massive amount of data, we're finding new things, never before possible, we can look at these relationships, and yes, we're making the best use of your tax money. Okay. That sounds a lot like we're out there doing big data the way Wall Street is, where you know, when you sit down and talk to astronomers, you're very, very sophisticated. You, know, you wouldn't say that to each other. You will talk about the fine points of pipelines and calibrations and what you trust and who you trust and what it takes to get to the point of, of actually doing science. So I would urge you when you're out talking in public and thinking about big data to be very careful about this misconception because it's all over the place right now. Is big data means big correlations. We don't need theory. We don't really need to do science anymore. It's going to trickle all the way down through education. And you know, be part of the solution and not part of the problem. I would encourage you. Okay. Uh, so we're back to reinventing the scholarly record and thinking about the sets of relationships. And I think if there's uh, the, the single biggest takeaway from the success of ADS from a scholarly communication standpoint is that it is you know, built into the fundamental design is a notion of how astronomers do their work. It's a way of thinking about the process of scholarship, the process of writing papers, when you draw on observations, when you draw on publications, when you draw on celestial objects, and pulling all of those pieces back, um, back together again. So, um, Michael, thank you for this one. I think it's a. Well, it's Elizabeth Bowler. Okay, Liz, is Elizabeth here? here. Yeah. Elizabeth, thank you. Thank you. This is wonderful. This is. I think that I couldn't have picked a better one. And my uh, my, my, my my librarian mother's name is Betty as well. So that was particularly <laughs> particularly wonderful um, for this. So uh, Charles, you don't need to carry your app J under your shoulder anymore. You can you can just go to. Uh, you can just go to ADS. So it really has transformed the way scholarship is done. And it, it's a model for other fields, but it's not a model that's readily transferable because it is a model that's built on some very particular characteristics of astronomy and the way that astronomy is done. So let me just put up an acknowledgment slide. And thanks to all of you. You can see I borrowed lots of slides. and. Uh, talk to lots of people to get some input along the way. So thank you. I hope I've provoked a few things for discussion. As you may know, the, the talk is being webcast. So if there's any questions, I'll go around with the microphone so everyone can hear you. So, thank you. Now, you talked only lightly about money and not at all about <laughs> copyright. Um, did we just dodge a bullet by happening to be in a field that didn't have privately owned copyrighted journals? And is that why one of the reasons why ADS could move forward so quickly? Uh, what well, the journals are certainly copyrighted. But, they're, uh, but they're, your journals are largely managed through your professional societies rather than through, uh, through separate privately held companies. 
but the it's, I don't think it's a, it's not that clean a line. I mean, science and you know, AAAS is a private or sorry, is a scholarly society as well. Michael's wearing his pin. I forgot to wear mine um, for for AAAS. Uh, but science, nature, others have been real pushbacks in terms of being able to do this kind of openness. On the other hand, there's some. Um, there's some interesting things going on because the, the Beyond the PDF meeting that, that we went to, uh, and Tim's on the, the board, one of the organizing uh, for that, is trying to think of the scholarly literature less as individual units to be read with eyes on and think of it more as a corpus to be mined. And this is coming out more of the biomedical community than out of the physical sciences community where you, you want a big pharma wants to mine it, chemistry wants to mine it. And there, on the one hand, the copyright issues are absolutely huge, uh, but they are working on the technology for it. I, I met with Crossref uh, a couple of weeks ago about it, and they're looking for ways to do the mining. But again, you get down to definitional problems very quickly. They would like to say anything that's open access can be openly mined and things that are under, under full copyright, you're going to hit a paywall on. But coming up with a computable definition of open access turns out to be really, really hard. So um, I think the question is not so much about the copyright status of the journals, because these are copyrighted journals, but rather that the astronomy community has a very close relationship with its, pub with its publishers and works with scholarly societies and made those agreements early on before everything got as monetized as it is now. Okay. That's, yeah. the, that's the Being that, first was important. I think being, yeah. being first was important. <laughs> okay. It's, of course, way co more complicated. That's the simplest answer I can give. Other questions? Okay, I'll be controversial. Oh, good, thank you. <laughs> we see all these wonderful slides that put ADS in the center. And I love ADS. Yes. And it's a good place to be. But on the other hand, you could look at the picture from a different geometry. Anything could be the center. The important thing is that everything should be interconnected. And I think we're moving towards that direction. Well, that you can answer, so the, the question is about the interconnection. Well, we put ADS at the middle because this is ADS's birthday party. <laughs> you get the candles on the cake, you know, it's only fair. It could be the center of the um, But even so, I, you know, I mean, you know, I've certainly been thinking about it for this talk, but the fact that the, the publication, the journal article, has been this, the anchor of the scholarly knowledge chain from, you know, from the time that we began to document is, is an argument to continue to keep it at the center to the extent that you need a center. <coughs> but what you, what you really want is to be able to use everything to discover everything else. You'd like to be able to use the publication to discover the data, the versions, the proposal, the instrument, but you'd like to be able to start with the instrument and follow. You'd like to be able to enter this cycle, which is also you know, why that cycle doesn't have a beginning and end. You'd like to be able to, ideally, you want to be able to enter it at, at, at any point. But if you've only got 2D space, you've got to put something in the middle. <laughs> any other questions? One right here. There's one a couple in the back. So Chris, from, from having spoken with people in so many different fields, um, who do you think astronomers could learn something from? What could we do better? Well, that's not fair. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, what could astronomers do better? I don't know, astronomers seem to be the poster child for, so for solving, of, uh, solving a, lot of these, a lot of these issues for us. Um, the, the tools and interoperability are good, but there's certainly plenty of things that, that could be done more, more cleanly. And standing from the outside, the fact that you don't have any common way to say, you know, give me all of the 
um, observations that meets this set of characteristics is, is a real, it, it's a meta layer that, that seems really important that, that would help move the science to a next step if, if you could do that. Uh, but it may be possible in the physical sciences, I don't think it's possible in the life sciences, that they lack, you know, you have agreements up here that they, they don't have down here to begin to do that, that kind of coordination. Probably also a recognition of the existence of, of small science, that you know, most of the people doing big data seem to think everybody does big data and this is just how it's done. Where in fact, some of the people who are farther out the tail say, you know, we matter too. And we're doing some very interesting things and we, and we really are on the edges. And you know, we talk to cosmologists who say, you know, we're, we're the young stepchildren. And, uh, you know, our, our, our object, you know, ours is not ma as mature and we love the bib search in ADS, but none of the rest of us is, none of the rest is very useful to us. There, it, it's ignoring us. So, you know, you can certainly find the cases for that, that there's, there's plenty of unsolved problems. But I, I don't have a, a good, punchy, do this next kind of <laughs> answer. We have questions in the back. All right, one, two. So I just wanted to follow up on Charles' question a little bit, the question of money. Mm -hmm. uh, so recently I was talking to Mike, and he was telling me that, uh, for example, all of Archive is funded by $800,000. Roughly speaking, an archive is not just the place to put your papers if you're an astronomer or a physicist or a computer scientist or a mathematician or a statistician or, you know, name it. So there definitely seems to be some kind of mismatch between these two, and I was wondering if you had any thoughts about that, and also the direction in which even publication is going, that is towards open access and, and so on and so forth, whilst it's a good thing. Mm -hmm. Again, goes off, seems to be going off in this direction which everything on the internet basically goes off to, which is towards zero cost. So, the, the, the point I'm trying to make is that there is this expectation which is, kind of, which, which is getting propagated over time that things will be done, and things will be done without any cost structure to it. And I wonder if you have uh, experiences from other fields uh, which, which sort of compute with this kind of problem we find ourselves in. Ah, that, it's a very important question, and the, you know, and I, I certainly agree that people have this misconception of, of information wants to be free, and so you've got this, you've got this real mismatch of these incredibly expensive journals, particularly in the sciences, and then this everything wants to be free and expectation that you know whether it's a six month window or a twenty four month window, it's all going to be free, uh, where in fact. It costs a lot of people and a lot of money to do the quality of work and, and the kind of archiving and metadata add-on that does get done. And I mean that's part of what's so impressive that astronomy has seen that that's part of the instrument, part of the investment. I think it's a huge long-term danger because when it comes down to you know do we spend the money on the next instrument or do we spend it on the archive there's a real temptation to say let's let's get the fancier instrument rather than investing in the archive whereas the archive is what's going to produce the science for the generations to come because it's going to still be there long after the instrument is is out of service so it's a and i think it's a harder and harder argument to make the um, archive, the, the physics archive, Ginsberg et al., was, you know, got a very nice NSF grant to get it launched, and Los Alamos supported it for a long time, and then it moved to Cornell, and now Cornell has set up a consortium and, you know, is needing to get lots of other libraries and institutions around the world. It has turned out not to be free, and there's got to be some way to pay for these things. I mean, when I talk to university librarians and tell them, that um, the Infrared Processing and Analysis Center at Caltech has 150 people just doing that one slice of wavelength, they throw up their hands. That, you know, if we could hire three data librarians for the entire UCLA, we would be doing well. Okay. So that, you know, there's just a real order of magnitude. And I think there's, there's a lack of public understanding of what it takes to do this well. I think that's another place where astronomy can have a voice about how the investment in this infrastructure 
has paid off in the science. Uh, and you get into areas like the sensor networks, they simply have no place to put their data. So if NSF says, deposit your data, they say, where? There is, you know, there, no archive exists to put it in. And putting it up on your website is not an answer. The you know, university, you know, do you want to put it in Dash? You know, I mean, the Dataverse here is one of the few places that actually has stepped up and said, here's a place to bring your data. And so it's a Harvard is a model in, you know, in that respect for other universities that are trying to think about it. But that's a big university commitment over the long term. So there's a lot of people concerned about the digital dark ages, as we were talking briefly, and that Vince Cerf is back on this again and, and others, of a whole lot of materials going to get lost. And a lot of people are concerned about you know, what, has to, what has to go dark before people are going to realize that it's not all going to be free. I'm going to stop there. The open access question is worth several more talks, so let's see what these other people have to say. And if there's time, we can go back to it. One question? Um, I was hoping this was going to be on a lighter tone than that, but I've realized I'm going to end up saying I want you know, ADS to do more work, which could, of course costs money. <laughs> but um, with the change in the publishing landscape and um, this whole sort of somewhat open ethos, but our need to demonstrate our science to you know, the community that pays for us. Um, so there's a lot of you know, science outreach going on. There's a lot of discussions of work outside of the current paradigm of paper rebuttal, um, so blogs and things like that. Um, should ADS be capturing that? I have any easy questions. <laughs> <laughs> so should, e so should um, but, but again, it's an important question of, and the whole, have you found the whole alt metrics thing? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, <coughs> I'm, I'm very skeptical about the alt metrics. I've done, and I've done a lot of bibliometrics over the years. So there, there's really, there's two sides to this. One is, first off, the curatorial decisions is <coughs> a, a, you need to think of a collection as a collection where someone has said, this is in, this is out, go to ADS for the core literature, and you will find the, the, the final copy of record, as opposed to f having to figure out which of the five versions is the version that you want. So again, this is sort of the librarian curatorial function. So you need to decide if this is a collection that represents the authoritative record, or if this is a collection that represents everything you could possibly want. So, you know, Archive has its editorial policies. There's, you know, what's the Zenodo something, some new place to, you know, put things. Um, you know, there's this very, you're going to, you know, tie them all together again. But, the, you know, each of them is going to have its own policy. But it's this fact that the disaggregation and, and the reaggregation. So that, that's, the, that's that side of it. The alt metrics, what worries me is counting anything that can be counted. It's, it's worse than the correlation problem. And the, uh, you know, yes, I mean, those of us who you know, do, no, do bibliometrics know that it's you have to be very, very careful about the research method. And people who have not done bibliometrics before will say, oh, look at all this cool stuff we can count. And then you realize, the starting set, do you do these journals or these journals? Do you do these years or these years? Do you count first authors only? How do you divide up a 14th? Do you give one 14th credit to a 14 author paper? There's a whole lot of elaborate kind of methodological issues in doing this. And if you submit it to a scientometrics journal, you know, the peer reviewers will call you out for naive research design where if you want to come up with counting every bit of blog and tweet and counting them with the same weight, well, more power to you, but I hope we're not giving people tenure based on that. Tweet based tenure. Tweet based tenure. Oh, okay, just coined a new one, well, Jim, thanks. I think yet another way to game the system will emerge from that. You bet, you betcha, yes. We could go on for quite a while. I, I think we're already over time. Um, let's thank our speaker one more time.
And I'm, I'm going to take just two minutes to make sure that some of the unsung heroes that uh, Christine was referring to are properly acknowledged, at least on this occasion. Um, first of all, since, well, it is our birthday, we can uh, kind of be proud of it. And I wanted to kind of list out all the people that are currently involved uh, in our project and, and also the ones that have been in the past. Um, <clears throat> there's not enough time to do justice and explain what everybody is doing, but so I'll just read the list. Um, Steve Murray, RPI, who um, might get here at some point. He had an emergency today. Um, Michael Kurtz, uh, you've seen. I'm Alberto Comazzi. Carolyn um, Grant, who's uh, in the audience. Um, Edwin Henneken, Donna Thompson, Giovanni D'Amelia, Jay Luker, Roman Chila, who's not here today, Alexander Holacek, um, Rahul Dave, and uh, Christy Kristofsky. Uh, in the past, you already heard the names of Gunther Eichhorn, who was uh, a project manager for um, 15 years, Joyce Raid Watson, Todd Karakajan, who was with us at the very beginning, Elizabeth Bolin, our artist in residence, um, <laughs> Marcus Demleitner, um, who now works uh, at ARI, Vicente Ray Baikakoa, um, came from France, uh, Christina Hornby, um, who worked for us for a year, and Benoit Thiel, who um, actually works in the for Yelp, high tech industry now, <laughs> and the friends of ADS. It's uh, by definition an incomplete list of people that um, have helped us significantly, uh, especially with the curation and enabling the kind of aggregation that Christine was referring to. So these are people that typically have given us not just support but data that gets integrated in our system. Um, so. As you can see, librarians uh, are very prominent in this role. So the CFA library with Chris Erdman and um, his staff now and Donna Coletti in the past. Uta Grothkopf from ESO, um, the Space Telescope librarians, Jill Lagerstrom and S uh, Sarah Stevens Rayburn before her. Sally Boskin, who might be here. Um, yeah, there she is, right. Um, and Brenda Corbin. Um, before her, Marsha Bishop and Ella Bouton from NRIO, Liz Bryson, uh, Joy Painter and Helen Knudsen from Caltech, Marlene Cummings, University of Toronto, and Molly White from University of Texas. Again, it's an incomplete list, so forgive um, the people that I missed. And um, these are the collaborators from the main centers that um, you know are part of the astrophysics archives and. Uh, more in general, the virtual observatory. So the CDS we've mentioned, and Ned, um, Bob Hanish is the head of the VAO. Alyssa Goodman, our own Alyssa Goodman. Um, the whole Chandra group has been a great supporter. Um, Pepe, Arnold, Sherry, and it's a long list of people. Um, Alberto Conti um, represents a group of Space Telescope, and Karen LeVay is the archivist at MAST. Um, the American Astronomical Society has been uh, a great supporter. Chris Bemisterfer is the journal manager currently, but Peter Boyce was uh, really the, the person who saw the potential for all of this to um, bear the fruits that it has. And the RE also gave us uh, a, a lot of uh, bibliographic metadata in the past. And finally, um, thank you to the support that we get from NASA, ADS is possible because NASA believed in, in this project from the early days and continues to support us uh, through the astrophysics division. And our own institution, the Smithsonian Institution, um, the observatory, and uh, our own high energy division. Um, we have obtained some grant money from SI. Um, we have great support from SAO, the director's office, HCO, and uh, everyone in high energy, uh, but especially the administrative and system support that makes our life so easy. So thanks again. It's uh, time to celebrate. There's a reception in the lobby with um, wine, appetizers, um, and a cake for our birthday. I hope you can join <laughs> us. Thanks again.